I want to talk about the fact that you're a single man. You're 38 years old. Do you even want to be married? I do. And I, I, I do because I, I want to build a legacy. I, I want to build something with my wife. And I'll tell you, I go back and forth because my, my, my last relationship, you know, it did a number on me. I'm and that's what I want to talk about. It did a number on me. I'm on a journey to discover, uncover, and recover love. Now, as a national playwright, I've penned dozens of shows about relationships. As a filmmaker, I've documented the most beautiful committal of lovers at weddings. And as a divorcee, I know firsthand the brevity of marriage and the pain of its loss. I'm the Terrace with you, and welcome to the Dear Future Wifey Podcast. Welcome to the Dear Future Wifey Podcast. I'm your host, Latiris R. Winfield. Listen, I'm so excited to have this conversation with today's guest. I love it when I get a chance to sit down and just break bread and talk to my brothers. Now, this guy, he's a family therapist. He's an author and he's a speaker. Welcome to the Dear Future Wifey Podcast, my new homie, Jay Barnett. Man, what's up, brother? Thank you for having me, man. Jay, man, when I tell you I am so excited to just just have a conversation with you yeah. like like when we talked during our pre-interview we i mean we we chopped it up for about an hour and what i love so much about you is that you keep it lit and so uh here on the dear future wifey podcast we coined the acronym lit to stand for living intentionally and transparently and you're a brother that does exactly that so my question to you are we gonna keep it lit today yeah, we're going to keep it all the way lit, man. All right, now see, I, like, what, what, when you sit down at this table, now we, we, we talk about some stuff. So are you going to be transparent? Are you going to open up and share some of your experiences? <laughs> now I want you yeah. to, I want you to uh, yeah, be we'll a therapist that. today. I want you to be a brother that's going to keep it real and just talk. I'm going to be a brother. I need that. All right, well, cool. <laughs> then that's what it is. So um, oftentimes when men go through pain and, get, and go through heartbreak, we don't go seek therapy. We don't go get hurt. We don't get help. And oftentimes we self-medicate on drugs or alcohol or vagina. Uh, <laughs> and we just go around smashing chicks thinking we're going to find our healing uh, between the legs of the next woman. Um, tell me from a, a brother standpoint with the therapeutic background, of course, because you can't shake that. Why do we do that? That's a great question, man. You, you start out the gate. I got to. You're we got to. Gate. I think the reason being, man, is is when you look at men all together, and especially just us as brothers, right? What does healing really looks like? Yeah. Um, how do you process? How do you uh, really take what you've gone through, look at it, take yourself out of it, and be able to make a rational decision? We don't really know how to do that. And I think many times it's, it's associated with our upbringing, with what shaped us, with what mold us, is that we were taught how to get over it, but not how to really deal with things. To get over it. And so when it comes to hurt, brothers don't really know how to deal with hurt, man. Where did that start from? I think it started from our childhood. I think it started from our upbringing. And for an example, let's, let's, let's talk about just being athletes, right? Right. How most coaches are teaching you to ignore pain. Oh, uh, yeah. You know, how pain yeah. is temporary, how pain is not good for the body. And so you learn how to ignore your pain. And and I truly believe that men are just as emotional as, as women. Yeah. But we just don't give attention to our emotions because we've been led to believe that if I focus and give attention to my emotions, does this make me less of a man? And make us appear to be weak. And appear to be weak. Absolutely. It's the craziest thing. And, I, and you know, raising these young boys, um, I tell them to tap into their emotions because even with the son that I adopted, him being, you know, him having gone through a lot of traumatic experiences, you know, I can notice when he's is, is building up inside and then when he explodes, he explodes. And so what I'm trying to teach him is, how, hey, listen, it's, it's OK to cry. Let's talk about it. Did you go through anything growing up in the. While dating a young girl that that uh, is shaped your viewpoint of how to communicate or uh, deal with women. Oh yeah, absolutely, man. So, I, man, now that you say that, I think eh, this might be a good time to talk about that. All right. So All right. I, I'll talk about my first heartbreak. Okay. So seventh grade, Tamara Bolden. You're going to seventh grade, huh? Seventh grade, man. And um, <laughs> so, man, Tamara was this cute chocolate girl. I had been, you know, 
after her, you know, for like a few years, and in the seventh grade, you know, I, and I, I probably, I was a late bloomer, so, I, and I, and my, my dad was a pastor, so we were very, we were, um, I want to say, we were very sort of guarded in a sense to where we were a bit green. Yeah, yeah. You know, other kids were a lot more advanced and things yeah. to where, like, we couldn't watch BET <laughs> yeah. after 8 o'clock. You know, so it, we, we wasn't watching cable all day. Like, we was reading our Bible. Yeah. You know, so we, you know, we were sheltered a lot, man. And so she kind of saw me as to being this good guy. So summer, going into my eighth grade, my dad buys me a weight set because I'm playing football and I want to get ready for the upcoming season. And he's like, you know, I want you to get in shape and start lifting weights. I think it's time you start lifting weights. So I started lifting weights, started getting in shape, and really started developing uh, self-confidence in the aspect of how I was growing and developing because I think we all go through that aqua state. Yeah, point, yeah, right? definitely. And so I show up, man, eighth grade year, you know, first week of school, I'm, I'm feeling myself. And so I, I step to Tamara and you know, I tell her, like, yo, I, you know, what's up? <laughs> And she was like, oh, okay. I, and you could tell that she kind of saw me kind of, you know, okay, Jay, you know, Jay, Jay done did a little work, you know. <laughs> she was like, you know, you got your little muscles and stuff. You know, look at you. Look at you. <laughs> so, <laughs> man, we started dating. And back then in the 90s, you know, guys were very territorial. So I had a gold herringbone that I got uh, for yeah, Christmas. I remember that. So, I gave her my herringbone so everybody knows, like, yo, that's me. <laughs> you know how we do. Yeah, heck yeah. Mark your and, territory. And so not this was like really my first ever real girlfriend. And she was a real friendly girl with the guys and 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 some of the guys I knew because we played ball together, but I always felt some type of way about it. Yeah. And just like, yo, man, you talking to a lot of guys and you know, and Cause when I started dating her, I was I wasn't really friendly anymore, and so he said we anymore. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't friendly, man. You know, cause I've always been a very, very social person. So I was just like, man, you know, you, you talking to a lot of these dudes, and you know, who is this? Why are you guys talking yeah. that long and those things? And so I guess it started to annoy her. And long story short, she ended up breaking up with me. So, but but she didn't do it. She had a friend do it. Oh man! So she had a friend named Sharia Robinson. You know, and first and last names, boy. He called them man, out. Man, I, I would never, never <laughs> shall I ever forget this. So, Sharia Robinson, she, she's a heavy set girl. So, yeah. she, but she was known for throwing hands with dudes. <laughs> so, she come to the door, the bell, the bell is rung. And so, I'm like, okay. Um, <laughs> I wanted to talk to Tam. So, she, she was standing in the door. And she was like, she don't want to talk to you. Oh, she was blocking her. Yeah, she was blocking the door. And I was just like, yo, Tam, like, you know, come outside. <laughs> come out in the hallway. She was like, she don't want to talk to you. And by the way, here's your necklace back. Dude, Ma. You know, you ever feel that lump? Yeah, it'd be right throat? in your throat. You finna cry on, oh, on point man. right there. Dude, that was just like, I, I was done. I rode the bus home. I cried all the way home, sat on the seat. And my sister, we went to the same uh, junior high school, and she was like, "Jay, what's wrong with you?" And I was, I didn't say nothing, nothing, and I didn't know how to process. And then when I got home and told my mom, then my dad found out. He was just like, "Oh boy, get over that, you know, you, you. I mean, you in junior high, you, you don't know, you don't know what love is, and so you don't and, know what love is." So saying all I to say and to step back in a clinical uh, perspective and, and to help parents in this space. What parents should do a better job of is not only giving your child to, the space to express what they feel, yep. but leaning in that space to help them to understand what they are feeling. Yes. Because when you're a teenager going through a heartbreak, teenager going through puberty, teenager going through the challenges, uh, your hormones are changing, your body yeah. is changing, you know, parents often neglect kids in that stage. Yeah. And not have the conversation. And so for me, two things that taught me. It taught me that I felt like, well, I don't think women really want a good guy. Yeah. yeah. Second thing, it just really taught me that, shoot, don't nobody really care about your feelings. Get over it. To get over it. 
And see, oftentimes going through that space of getting over it, we don't know what to do in that space. And so we're most of the time we're making bad decisions on the getting over it phase. And what do you remember back in that time? What were you doing? So back at that time, like I stopped eating for a week. (laughs) Man, Terrence, I lost 10 pounds, bro. I lost 10 pounds, man. I'm serious, man. I lost 10 pounds. Like my mom was like, you know what, what? What? What's going on? What did this girl do to you? And it wasn't so much what the, what 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 she did to me. It's what it taught me. And what that's it, good. And then what it taught me because I wasn't trying to be overbearing when I was asking her these questions about these guys. I was just trying to get an understanding. Understanding. There it is. There it is. That's good. Keep talking. I was just trying to get an understanding because you know, for myself, I'm like, all right, I know, you know, we're 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 in this little dating thing, you know, we're young, but I'm also trying to understand, you know, why are you having these long conversations with these guys? So I, I don't know. And and I think at that time too, who's able to to really decipher between what a platonic friendship is opposed to you all teenagers. So he thinking about the same thing you think. One hundred percent. You know what I'm saying? Just keep and, they, and, they, and they ain't changed even now. In today's, you know, at the ages that we are now, I mean, that's where you find yourself oftentimes getting played on the most is by the quote unquote friends. You exactly. Know? Exactly. So it's, it's it's interesting. So continue. And so for me, during that time, I just felt like, man, dude, I, I don't know what to do with this. And and then also my parents were going through a divorce, so I was in a Miss of that, acting out in class, and what it did was it made me angry because I couldn't mm-hmm. do anything about her breaking up with me, and it made me just feel like my my dad is has has called us uh, into uh, their bedroom to tell us that you know they're getting a divorce. I'm going through this breakup. So we having to give attention to what's going on with our parents and no one is giving attention to what we're feeling in either space. That's interesting because you're you're experiencing two breakups at the same two time. Two breakups at the same uh, time. Uh, a breakup that you're personally going through as a child and then an adult breakup. So that can be extremely traumatic on shaping your ideology on relationships. So what did your relationships look like after that moment? My relationship looked like after that moment, I think I have maybe two serious relationship in high school and they were very, a pretty long relationship because we moved from Mississippi and, and moved here to Texas. And, and my relationships were always like, I just started focusing on football because I, I didn't really want to experience another pain, no pain like that again. And, and I didn't get back into a serious relationship. I think I had one serious relationship in college and then I tried to date, like, because I wasn't really, like, a serial dater type of guy because, you know, my parents, you know, they had strictly enforced, you know, us to be very guarded with dating, very guarded. You know, that's all they said. But they didn't really give us the breakdown of what that looks like. On what like. that looked like. You know, so. That's where we fail so much in the uh, in, in the church. You know, we say, hey, you need to make sure that you preserve this and you be very careful. But what does that look like? And oftentimes, I, I mean, I don't think they really knew how to articulate that. They just no, be like, they, don't have sex until you get married. No, they didn't. And, and, and rather telling me not to have sex, explain to me what the benefit is, but also explain to me what the possible consequence of it, because now that gives me a greater understanding yes. of how to make my choice to make an informed decision exactly. based upon just, you told me to do this. And then they'd be like, it ain't good. And then you actually slip up and actually experience it. You like, I don't know what y'all talking about. This is wonderful. Exactly. Like, did you just say this ain't good. Y'all trying to hold me back from my blessings. <laughs> <laughs> what are y'all doing? See the church, y'all lying to me instead of, like you said, talking about the consequences right. and those consequences don't feel good at all. When you, when you're going through your high school relationships and your college relationships, were you reserving a large portion of yourself from that woman due to the pain that you experienced in, in the uh, eighth grade? Oh yeah, man. I was reserving a, a, a huge part of because at the time, you know, kids were having sex yeah. back then. And so we weren't, I was a virgin man up until like I went to college. So for me, I wasn't, you know, I was just like, all right, all right, you can call me whatever you want. I'm not doing that. You know what I mean? And so, so why were you so strong about that? I was so strong, I think, too, because my faith, because not only did my parents, 
you know, tell us about, you know, not having sex and those things. But I had my own relationship with God and Christ at a very young age. So I had my own experience and it wasn't so much from what my parents taught me. It was what I bled. I mean, what I believed for myself. And that allowed me to stay focused and, and football just became my outlet because I can be angry there. I can be vicious. You know, I, I can just be this dog, this animal. So yeah. when I put that helmet on, man, so when I was thinking about the breakup, when I was thinking about the move from Mississippi, because the kid who got in the car or got in a U-Haul truck from Mississippi wasn't the kid that got out here in Texas. Mm. Because that kid that got out of the, the U-Haul truck here in Texas, man, that kid was an angry kid because his life has just changed in a matter of a summer. Drastically. Drastically. I mean, like the 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 pastor, the father that you that was in your home is no longer in your home. You know what I'm saying? Because you was you you uh, was raised by your mom at that point. Who got custody of you? Yeah, my mom. Yeah. My mom took us. And so when you went through that, and it's interesting that you said that as a, you know, that you made the decision on your own to be a virgin. I definitely got to shout out my my son uh, who I adopted last year, Armani, who's behind the camera. Armani came to me, um, shoot, probably a couple of months after he moved in with me. And he said that he wants to be a virgin until he gets married. And I said, what wow. made you, what made you think, what made you say that? He said, I just believe that that's just, I, I just don't want to be out here just having sex with people. That's just not right. And it was interesting. I'll be transparent. He saw, he saw, uh, he was going through the armrest of my, in my car and he came across a box of condoms. He's like, dad, why do you have these condoms? I said, what do you mean? Why I have them? He was like, he was like, man, um, you shouldn't be having sex. You shouldn't be. I said, well, I'm not having sex currently right now, but if, you know, if something pop off, then, you know, I got to be ready. He said, dad, you're not married. You shouldn't be having sex. I said, boy, if this boy here, I said, Did he is really? yeah, I was like, man, if you don't get up out my house over here, boy, I'm raising you. You don't raise me. <laughs> so, and I sat there, I was like, man, and I tried to hit him with, you just don't understand, you know, <laughs> stay in the child's place, boy, leave me alone. <laughs> I need to shoot. Nah, that's, it's that's, stressful. Life is stressful, but yeah. shoot, let me let me self medicate. So, uh, <laughs> so he, I said, "Man, what's wrong with you?" But he he convicted me in that moment, and I was like, "Okay, all right, Armani." And I said, "So, what do you think?" I said, "He said, yeah, I, I hear about kids at our school. They're having sex and they doing all that. I just don't want to do that." Yeah. And I hit him. I said, "Well, the woman you're gonna marry probably didn't have sex with somebody." He's like, "No, I'm gonna choose somebody that didn't." I said, "The odds of you finding a woman that's a virgin is slim to none." And he was just like. Pretty much God can do all things. And he said, if I save myself, then I want a woman that saved herself. And wow. I said, All right, boy. All right, then. Wow, I can't take credit. Yeah, I can't, I can't, I can't take credit for that. I said, that's nothing but God just working through you. And uh, so I just want to encourage you, Armani, to continue down that path yeah. and uh preserve that. That'd yeah, be likewise, so, so dope. Man. Yeah, because yeah. I and, and I'd be honest, like my senior year is 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 when I I was pressured into it, bro. Yeah. And, and I'll be honest, even men who deal with sexual trauma and people don't believe this, most men's sexual experience has been from a woman forcing or that door was opened by yeah. a, a, a woman yeah. of yep. some sort. Yep. I mean, you know, whether it was the babysitter or whether it yep. was, and, 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 and I know we're not really talking about this, but this is why a lot of men deal with sexual trauma silently because who is going to believe them yeah yep and then too how will they be viewed because even for for my experience i just remember feeling pressure like everybody else was doing it and i'm just kind of like i'm not really on what everybody else doing yeah. but yeah and i made the decision you know, yeah. you know made the decision um to do it but i just remember even saying no the first time and being called like, oh, you scary. Yeah. What you you're scared of? You a little punk. Yeah, you look and and so and and these are the messages that we hear as boys that really shape how we see ourselves. And how we see shape, women. And how we see women. There it is. Because yeah. now I'm thinking like, okay, do you really want a guy to really treat you <laughs> with respect and with, honor? With respect. Because that's what I was raised to do. So I I, I remember, you know, man, just, we just keep, we'll it, keep all, it real. We we'll keep, keep it all one thousand, man. I remember this girl. I'll never forget this in high school. Went over to the house, and you know, we we were we had been dating, and um, at the time, my mom was married, had remarried, and she had met my stepdad, who was also a minister as well. I don't know how my mom did that, <laughs> but 
but that's a whole nother story. <laughs> Go buy my book, Hello King. Hello and, King. Uh, and, and they would tell you that story because he was very physically abusive. But so the girl met him. And so she was like, wow, man, your stepdad is just really strict. And really, I mean, he was just strong with it, man. Like, yeah, Jay ain't having sex. Jay ain't doing nothing. Not at all. And so, <laughs> so in her mind, she's like, yo, I'm finna prove dude wrong. Oh, for real? So she said she's gonna turn you out. They're gone for a few days. And so she comes over. Man, literally, she got naked. Like, you know, we was kissing and all of that stuff. And then she just got like, you know, just just took all her clothes off. And I'm like, oh wow. <laughs> and and I'm I gonna have tell, a decision I'm, to make I'm, at I'm, this I'm, point. And but I'm gonna tell you how my stepdad and he had, and, and even how he had infiltrated my mom mindset. This dude, I remember this guy, bro, praying a prayer. He said, if you ever try to have sex, I'm praying that God don't let it get up. <laughs> and guess what? <laughs> it, it must say, <laughs> well, let's sleep like a mother. Wake up. Here's your time. Here's your time. Come on, bro. jump in the ring, champ. Come on, champ. Come on. You pep talking. And mother. <laughs> Man, bro, knocked out, she, sleep, and she was like, "What's wrong with you? <laughs> Do you not want me?" I'm like, "It's God. He's cock blocking. Yeah, like, <laughs> <laughs> it's God. <laughs> it's like God is cock blocking. <laughs> That's real." And man, and all I can think about is hear my head is him saying, "I pray it don't get up." <laughs> <laughs> so we never did, but I remember oh, going back to school. Probably like that next week, man. And she didn't tell everybody. She didn't tell anybody, but well, she good. just. But then again, see, here's the thing, you know, and, and we're being very, being very lax. Is this is why you have to really teach kids their identity beyond the social messages that they receive from their peers? One hundred percent. Because she, just because we didn't have sex, and you know, God was shutting minds down and. She felt rejected. Yes. She felt undesirable. Undesirable. She felt I didn't want her. And I really liked her, but I was just like, hey. I, that. Did you ever tell her that your, your, your stepfather prayed that against you? No, I never told you? her that. Never told her that. Well, no. But, hey, now she you stopped out there. dating me, and so I date another guy. So, yeah, that's so, how that went. So, listen, uh, if you out there, young lady, he, he found you very attractive, and it was just God, like, hindering him. Yeah. <laughs> So it wasn't you, it was God. No, Blame it, it wasn't. God. It, it wasn't you. Yeah, blamed on God. All right, and so now fast forward. Um, we talked about the traumatic experiences that we go through, and it continues to carry on. Have you ever been in love in your adult life? And let me ask you: the last relationship that you've been in was how long ago? Two years ago. Two years ago. Were you in love with that person? I wasn't in love uh, because we, we, we hadn't been dating that long, but I, I did care deeply about her. So how long were y'all dating? Uh, about six months. Six months. So you cared deeply. What's the difference between caring deeply for somebody and being in love? I think love is something that has to evolve. And not so much that it uh, over time, but we were growing there. And I think cared deeply was that I couldn't really say that and really mean it from the place and from the depth that I, yeah. I would you know, want it to be because I was still kind of filling in the situation out and still filling her out within those six months. But I cared deeply to where I cared about her well-being. Um, she had a child. I cared about a child. I cared about, you know, um, just her as a person. But the whole love thing is because when, when, you, when you start telling people that you, you love them, you are setting a standard on how you're going to operate with them. Boy, that's good. That's good. Hold on, because we I, I didn't even think about that part. You're setting a standard in how you're going to operate with them. When you tell someone you love them, you are setting a standard in how you are going to operate with them. Yeah. Unpack that. Because the moment that, I mean, you think about it. If, you, if, you, if, you're, if you're dating somebody... And you guys are just seeing each other. And, I mean, let's say eight months. You guys have been seeing each other. And it's, it's been good. It's, it's flowing. And you, you, you both feel it. You, can, you know, you can sense it from her. You know, you, she can sense it from you. 
but it's still almost like there's there's almost there's a it's not a real solid foundation, foundation that yeah, you to guys build really something off of to really build something off of and so it's almost like well we know we like each other but we don't really know what this like is is about and where this like is going to go from the moment that you tell her yo I'm just going to use Tasha and Tasha I think I'm falling in love and I, and 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 I and I love you automatically yep it's just shifted expectations expectations just shifted and now you are setting a standard that I am going to operate and move differently with you because I feel this and I just verbalize this, I just express this, and I just convey this to you. And that's interesting because it's funny when the whole thing around who's going to tell the other person that they love them first. Right. It's like that's the big, okay, I want to say it, but I'm not. I talked to a friend who just went through a breakup, and she said, I said, did you, uh, were you in love with him? She was like, ah, uh, yeah, well, and she took a long time. We had this conversation yesterday, and then she said, "Okay, I loved him, but we never he, we never told each other that." And, and I said, "He never told you." She said, "No," and I never told him. And I said, "Why?" She says, "I, I don't know. I just I don't know." And I was like, "That's interesting because I always think that that's there's something in that too. If you if you can't find yourself vulnerable enough to say you love that person when in fact you do, then that's." That's something there. That's something that either you're, there's some trust issues where you say, if I tell them that, I'm becoming too vulnerable and I can find myself hurt or that they will take advantage of the fact that I love them. And, and now my love may be viewed as a weakness and now they can dominate me in this space. It's right. such an interesting uh, thing that happens in that moment. Let me ask you this. Have you ever been in love in your adult, in your adult life? Yeah, I have. Have you been married before? No, engaged. Twice. So you've been engaged twice. And so before the girl, the last relationship, how far back was the other relationship? Uh, Whatever relationship that you were in love in? Uh, probably a couple of years. So you went two years being single before you got into the last relationship? Yeah, yeah, I did. So you take, you take do, is that typical for you? You'll take a lengthy yeah, amount of time? Yeah, I take a lengthy amount of time because one of the things that I wanted to do is I wanted to start really – you know, after I'd spent years in therapy for dealing with my depression and dealing with my own personal things, I wanted to just kind of really take time to to look at the patterns, you know, when I was dating. And I never forget that I really had to give attention to the women that I was choosing. We're not bad women, but then what was it about these women that made me choose them? Was there a common thread between all of them? Yeah, it was a common thread. The common thread was that I saw a part of my mother in them, and I was always trying to rescue my mom them oh boy that right there just almost brought a tear to my eye let me tell you something you know how deep that is yeah it's but real. how long did it take you to figure that out <sighs> man it took a long time i mean i'm 38 and i think you know it's been what two two years since the last relationship and i really because what i was doing was when my parents were together and i was actually talking to a friend about this last night talking to about my mom my mom was such a vibrant lady. She was an evangelist. She was very powerful. She's like, I mean, she was a great dresser. I mean, my mom could just style herself, man. Like, she rocked all the dope glasses. She had some <laughs> of the best church hats that you've ever seen, man. Literally, people would come to my dad's church just to see what my mom was wearing. That's nice. That's dope. I mean, everybody wanted to see Miss Mary. Yeah. And my mom just had a beautiful personality, but my dad never cultivated that. And so when they divorced at 13, I saw my mom morale go down. I saw her joy. I saw her laughter. I saw so much change in her. And so when I would get with these women, I was dating women that I was like having to build, speak life into. Yeah. Because all right, my dad didn't do this to my mom, yes. so I'm going to speak life into you. I'm going to look at your dream. I'm going to look at your vision. And what get you get behind do. and support. I'm going to get behind you, and I'm going to support you. I'm going to do this. And and what I realized, and i never forget I was dating this young lady, and she says, Jay, the, the, the issue is is that you see what you see in me what I don't see in myself. And I said, and she said, I said, what do you mean? She's like, you're trying to recreate something, Jay. She said that to you? She said, you're trying to recreate something 
with me that you didn't have. And I was like, whoa. And how old were you when this conversation happened? What, 30 something? So that woman saw that. Yeah, she saw it. That you were trying to recreate something in that her. I didn't have. And I was like, yeah, you're right. I was like. You understood what that meant when she said that? I understood what she meant because it made me think about, you know, the childhood experience I had. Because even when you come into therapy, right, it's so important that we have an understanding of what you went through as a child. Because as we travel back to the past, it helps us to travel through the present. Yeah. So you need that. And for me. I wanted to be what my father wasn't. I wanted to be faithful. I wanted to be committed. And then I wanted to build, you know, whoever I was with. And so I just thought, you know, well, this is what I was supposed to do. And and it's even the times that I got engaged, I was very ill-informed. Um, I didn't really know what I was doing because I didn't really have the guidance. But I just thought, you know, it's, 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 we've been dating <laughs> The amount of time this, 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 next step is marriage. Yeah, next step is marriage. And so, uh, and, and that's why I think it's important, man, for people to have counselors, therapists, yeah, guidance coaches, accountability you know, partners, accountability partners, mentors, because so much of what of what we do is centered around what we've been taught. And sometimes it's not the best way. And it's not the way that will lead to healthy because most of us have been taught or we attribute love to how much pain that we can take. Say that one more time. So most of us attribute love to how much pain we could take. If there's no pain, then there's no love. Well, there's pain in it. Well, then it's got to be love. That reminds me of a, um, on Red Table Talk this last week where Will said, well, Jada said, Will, I didn't know if you possessed the capacity to love me uh, on this level or uh, not quoting her correctly, but as deeply as he did. But it was only she's she's quantifying that based upon what she took him through. And we do that a lot with men. We go, yeah, I got me a ride or die chick. And that's because you done took her through hell and high water, done broke her heart, done cheated on her all the time, done disrespected her all in her face and be like, I got me a ride or die. And we're quantifying that based upon the pain that we put that person through. And we got to really change the trajectory of that. While I believe that love is sacrifice, it shouldn't be um, intentional where you go, okay, we're all working through our idiosyncrasies and our, and our weaknesses and, and our faults and failures but it shouldn't be that all oh, this person really really this is real love because i took them through hell <laughs> yeah i think the most dysfunctional destructive toxic perspective ever because don't take me through hell just to test and see how much i love you or to see how much the love is because you might like, come up short you may you know, may come we, up losing me in the process yeah, ex exactly and and i think we have to move away from that thought process because it's very dysfunction but think about it most of what we do is we function in dysfunction because that's the system that created us i want to talk about the fact that you're a single man you're 38 years old do you even want to be married i do and i i, I do because i, I want to build a legacy I, I want to build something with my wife and i'll tell you i go back and forth because my my, my last relationship you know it did a number on me I'm and that's what I want to talk about. It did a number on me. So, I mean, so, I, so that that was two years ago. Yeah, two years ago. So that was back in 2018 or 2019. 2018. So started da started dating in 2017. Uh, broke up at the top of 2018. Okay, but it was a six month relationship. Yeah. Okay, so it was six months and it caused a lot of damage. And this is what men don't talk about. Why? What happened? The, the reason men don't talk about it because, for one, we don't have the space to talk about it. That's true. Secondly, what does that look like to even talk about it? Am I going to look like a punk? Am I yeah. going to look like a whole nigga? I'm yeah. just keeping it 100. Yeah. Am I going to look like, you know what I'm saying, like, oh, oh, oh you hurting. Oh, you, you know what I'm saying? You let this, because you, we've been there. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. And so, um, and that's why we don't, because it's the fear of being judged, mocked, or ridiculed for how I feel about what I was put through because we often see the woman share her side of the story. Yes. And we feel like, oh, he'll be all right. It didn't bother him, but it does. And that's a, it's interesting. We're going to talk about what you 
I want to interject this because I saw a lot of posts about August Alcina saying, what dude get all this good pee from Jada and then come out and talk about it and talk about how he hurt. You know what I'm saying? And they See? victimized him for being, uh, first of all, they, they're not taking into account that, I'm going to do a whole little video about this, but they didn't take into account that he was young. He was literally in his early 20s dealing with a woman close to her, or, or close to 50 and Dealing with a drug addiction, so he's already broken. You can see the noticeable pain and confusion in this young man's life. Yeah, you can. But he dare not speak about it because now when he speaks about it, he's like, That's, he a punk. Girl, you need you should get your behind, yeah. you should get your vagina to somebody else and, and shut and, them and, out. And for the women, this is why men just sit with their stuff. Yep. Because this is what happened. Yep. And I'll be honest with you, he was a victim of grief. Yes. That's what he was a victim of. He was dealing with so much grief, so much pain. And then that space was not only taken advantage of, but that space was manipulated. Yes. Yes. But and don't talk about Don't talk but, about it. But, 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 yeah, but yeah, yeah, don't talk about Don't it. talk about that part. You know what I'm yeah. saying? And so, you know, for me, um, you know, the breakup happened and there's a conversation about, okay, how do we move forward? Because we work together. And I'm thinking, all right, you know, we're going to have a conversation like adults. We'll be able to walk away from this amic uh, amicably. And so I'm just kind of like, all right, how, you know, I'm thinking things are good. So uh, probably what was this? Because this was at the top of 2018. We had like a face to face conversation about how do we bring this back together um, in, a, in a therapeutic, uh, a therapeutic setting. With a therapist, I was invited in, and for invited me, to her therapist. So she yes. she had a therapist, and she invited you to yes. come in and invited. have a conversation about uh, mending y'all's relationship. Yeah, okay, exactly. And so um, I, I didn't want to do it. I, I wasn't because I still had the little pain because that was some words said that I just kind of like I just couldn't get with man. And I think too, you know, even hold as on, men, I want I, I want to touch on that. What words? We talk a lot about words, and they hurt a whole lot deeper. So that so there was a point where um, she was going through some challenges, and in these challenges, I was there as any, I hopefully any dude was, and I'm talking about like really there, like standing there, staying the night, making sure she's good, all those things. And then one day I heard, or it was said to me, I fell out of love with you. She said that she said that to somebody about no, you? No, she said that to me. So she said, you know, I fell out of love with you, and I'm just kind of like, okay. And it was confusing to me. Yep, that seventh grade again, boy. That seventh grade boy is here. Going this. back to seventh grade. Yes. It was confusing to me because I'm like, yo. I'm here for we, you. I'm rocking just, for you. We just, we just came through like a tumultuous, yeah. you know what I'm saying, time. And... I, you know, I, w I was here. Yeah. You know, I'm here, you know, driving you to where you need to go. I'm here making sure you're you good. Like, how can we, you know, how can I, you know, make this better? And so when I heard that, I immediately, I checked out. And so we had another conversation probably like maybe some, some weeks later. And, she, you know, she said, well, I didn't really mean that. <laughs> I was just saying that to be hurtful. And for me... When I heard that, man, again, I went back to the seventh grade kid because I'm like, all right, what do women really want? Yeah. Because I'm not perfect by any means, but I do know, like, my heart is gold. And, you know, I got sisters, so anything that I can do to help the person that I'm with, I'm going to make sure that I, I go, the, go, go those lengths to do that. So... Fast forward, that's what just really just pushed me in. And to me, because I feel like, and this is where women have to really be cautious with your words. Because you can't, because see, there's an honor code that we operate as men. As men. See, the once you say I'm your homeboy, you my homeboy, yeah. we know, all right, there's a level of mutual respect. There it is. That we're going to always keep it 100, and we're going to keep it above the table. Yep. Because we know if we go... Beneath this table, then, then be that's boxing. not coming back. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? And so, 
And a lot of times women don't take into consideration because let's be mindful. Let's, or should I say, let's be honest. Not many people are mindful enough to be emotionally intelligent, even in spaces that they feel like they have been, you know, uh, on the other side of pain. Yeah. So it's not to ignore that nothing didn't happen to you, but also being able to hold the space that let's hear the full situation and let's look at this intelligently from an emotional perspective that we both heard it. Yeah, yeah. So how do we provide the safe space for us both to talk and express and to get some understanding? And so for me, I, I just thought, okay, this is, this is where I'm at. And I, I'm, I'm going to choose to stay here. And I wasn't ready to move from that space because, again, anytime a man tried to express himself, I felt always shut down. Shut down. And then I felt, okay, I speak with my hands, so if I'm speaking with my hands, you were interpreted as I'm aggressive. Grand aggressive. <laughs> and I'm just like, man, so I just couldn't win. So <laughs> I just I just checked out. So fast forward. You're in this counseling session. Fast forward. I sit in this session, and I don't say anything. The counselor's like, hey, you. I'm like, no, nah, have a conversation. After the counseling session about, you know, possibly working things out, I'm just not with it. So... Did you um, tell her that, or you just internalized that? No, I, I I told her that. Okay. Yeah, I told her that. So, a few months go by, um, and again, I don't really have the space, and then to really talk and share, you know, I confide in some people that I'm yeah. thinking is safe, and then apparently I found out that it's not safe. Yeah. And, and that's one thing I'm I'm so big on now, bro. It's, it's safe not spaces, violating man. safe spaces. It's not violating safe spaces, man. It's like. I'm so I'm I'm always transparent. I'm gonna always be that. That's who I am. Yeah. But I have learned to be selective where I'm vulnerable at. Yes. And what women don't understand is like that's not a space that a man is gonna give you freely. <laughs> so like not. you you're not gonna get that quick. You're not gonna slide in the DMs and give me a hey king and this and that and I support you. I believe you and just think I'm just gonna be vulnerable <laughs> with you. Like it doesn't work like that. And I have women who do that, and I'm just kind of like, well, I just feel like you're so guarded. Yeah, I'm guarded because I want to use wisdom <laughs> on who because, I who I expose myself to. Exactly because I don't know, and this is the fear, ladies, with men. We don't know what you're gonna do with our vulnerability. Yes, because of, we don't want to be emotionally blackmailed. Yep, with what we share. Yes. Because that's the ammo that you always have. Yes. I, I, I mean, very rare. Correct me if I'm wrong. Very rare do I see a dude get on social media and go on a rant about a relationship. <laughs> no, he don't. So many times, and, and, and especially with black men, man, we always feel like we're in a proven state. Yes. And we got to prove ourselves. To everybody. So, so when a brother comes to try to share, oh, he hurt, hurt. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> that but, is what they but, say. And, and they hurt, said hurt. in the in the space of where, so bro, it's almost like <laughs> an oxymoron. You get in a relationship with a man, and you say, "Open up to me. Tell me what's wrong. Tell me what's." But outside of the relationship, you talk about men who open up and say things about that they experience. Oh, he hurt her. Oh, girl. I guess she must have. Again, it, it's like it's men crazy. we get treated as if we're not humans. Yes. As yeah. if we don't have these feelings. And I've run this 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 men's group over in uh, Oak Cliff Chamber of Commerce. Do you know most of the men have said that when they have tried to be open about their feelings. It's shut down. It's been shut down. Shut down. Shut down. I did this men's. I was in this uh, when I was a member of Covenant Church. Uh, they started this program that's still around the day called um, it's called Camp Freedom, and I was I was selected to be one of the first men to go on this retreat, and it was about twelve of us there, and we just shared. It was a powerful, powerful experience. But here we are, these twelve men from you know, from different backgrounds, black, white, Hispanic, and we literally spent three days. Away from your cell phone, you couldn't ha bring your cell phone on the trip, and we just was in the in the woods, and we just broke bread and talked and shared stuff. And I was like, "Wow, men, we really don't share stuff." Men were crying, we were heartbroken, we land before the Lord, worshiping God, and I was like, "This is the most beautiful atmosphere I've ever experienced," because it was a vulnerability that took place in that place that it was like men could actually 
exhale. You saw a movie called Waiting to Exhale about women uh, exhaling once they found love, but men were able to truly exhale and say, I'm tired. That's why I believe men die uh, sooner than women from heart attack yep. and all that type of stuff. I, we, I don't, we, we don't get those moments. No, we don't get those moments. And that's why it was so important for me to become a, a, a therapist as a black man and, and to create these safe spaces uh, to be able to help men because that's good, God, man. Kudos. God, God took me through my own process and, and still taking me through a process. So hold, when did you become a therapist? So this is my going into my second year. Okay. Yeah, second so year. so that came after this this past breakup. Yep. And I was still in grad school going through the internship process and all those different type of things, man, that trying to manage school, manage processing, manage my therapeutic lens because I knew what was going on in the situation, but what was what was hard for me is that in May she, you know, came out and released some videos and, and, and said these things. And again, they were things that I shared. Again, your truth is your truth. Yeah. I didn't agree with it because I, I was there and I'm like, none of those, when I was told because I never did go watch it or whatever. But I'm, but for me. Truly, these videos talking about you or videos of you. Yeah. No, no, these are videos like, you know, he did this, he did that. And when by the time, bro, I'm, I'm going to just be honest with you, man. It was the most difficult time in my adult life because a few months ago, we just had a conversation. About her trying to get back with you. You know, and exactly. And so now all of a sudden, I'm this type of person and things that I shared in private. I'm to my pillow talk stuff. Yeah. Well, you know, he said this and he said that. And, you know, he told me this. This is why he and I'm just kind of like, man. And I think the hardest thing was that. When I saw it, because my phone is blowing up, I'm in the gym, and people are like, yo, dude, have you seen social media? I'm like, no, nah, I haven't. She put it on social media. It's like, dude, you need to go see it. So I saw it, and immediately the spirit spoke to me and said, don't respond. Mm-mm-mm. And I'm like, all right. People were in my inbox all day, bro. Like, bro, this girl finna drag you, dude. I'm talking about people that I spoke for on their programs, you know, was sharing it and this and that. And I'm just like, man, none of this. I'm like, dude, like, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't even respond even to myself. And I remember going home and just getting in the bed, man, and just like, God, what is going on? And I mean, and it's just like, he wouldn't stop the bleeding. And he was taking me not only through a process, but I felt like, all right, this is a stage that you're taking me through. But the hardest thing was just not being able to state my truth and to really talk about how I felt in this. I went through a similar experience last year. And in January, God gave me the quote. That's why if you walk in my office, you'll see it on the wall on a big old mural. He said, let your character outlive their lie. Yeah. And I said, what does that even mean? He said, you are who you are. Lies will be spoken against you. It's the same thing that Jesus had to do. Lies will be spoken against you, but you let your character outlive their lie. And yep. so you can, you, cause you can keep fueling it the, the minute that, you know, you and I talked about this, that if you decide to respond about it, then, then they go back and say, well, he said this and it, well, oh. she said this and it just keeps living and living and yep. living. And you're like, oh my God, this is never going to die. And so when God told me, let your character outlive their lie of saying that he wants to build a fortitude inside of you to be able to stand by your character. So that when people actually meet you and, like, you know, they'll they'll believe the lie for only a second and then they get around you and they go, OK, hold on. Some ain't adding up. Yep. And then when they start saying some may adding up, then they start finding out the truth uh, on their own without you having to say anything. anything. And exactly. but it's it's painful because it's that process painful. takes a whole Man, lot longer than me saying, Hold on, no, hold on, no, you ain't gonna be lying on me, you know what I'm saying? And so that process is longer, but that process is so worth it because now you truly the Bible says vengeance belongs to the Lord. Yep. And so and the God says, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. So either we're gonna fight our battles or we're gonna say, Here, God, I'm gonna let you to fight, I'm gonna let you fight it. And then when God fights it. You'll come out just like, I mean, you won't have a scar or scratch. You will come out the fire not smelling like smoke. And you'll be you'll build a a, a different type of character where you're able to weather any storm. Man, that dude, you just preach. And that's <laughs> and that's exactly how it was for me. I remember God telling me, said, Don't take this personal. 
Mm, mm, mm. He said, this is not what I'm trying to do to you, but there's something that I want to do through, through you. you. And, mm, mm, mm. and I'm just like, I mean, and I was having a conversation. I said, God, this don't feel good. Like this, this woman just went on a tangent, man. Assassinated my character. Assassinated my character. And I'm like, you don't want me to say nothing? <laughs> he said, don't say nothing. Probably a couple months later, I'm here in Dallas at the Potter's house. And Bishop Jakes is preaching, and literally Bishop Jakes stopped doing his message and just started speaking into my life, man. Not personally, not just, not just speaking. He personally, personally spoke to me, came me off out, the stage. Yeah, and just personally just started pouring, started speaking. And I, and God says, I told you, I got this. Mm, mm, let, mm. let me do this. And even to this day, man, people don't know that I was going places to speak. They would tell me that, hey, we received these phone calls. We received these emails from this person. And they would tell me the name. And I was just like, drop my head. And I'm just like, man, are you serious? And uh, the messages that I was receiving in my DMs, I mean, from people that, you know, were, were I, they had to be connected to her account because the stuff that they were saying in my DM. Man, I got accused, man, from everything to abuse to being gay to being i mean just oh bro it was the stuff so she was, reach, she was she was reaching out to um yeah when i went to go speak. different clients different yeah. clients and, and, and engagements you had and just sharing stuff with with <laughs> with your potential clients no ain't yeah. potential clients people that have booked you to come and speak and do yeah. stuff yep would would share and i mean the stuff that people like i mean messages people would send me hey we received this and I remember one day, man, and I actually, I was sitting on an airplane when I got a call from uh, one client who was actually a church. And they said, hey, we just received a call from her and um, a message. Or, and, um, and I just dropped my head and I just said, God, like, I really don't know what to do in this space, man. And what was so painful about it is that having to go through it and just take it. Yes. That's the hard part. Boy. You know, because it's like God had already told me not to respond. So I didn't put anything on social media. Um, I talked with my attorney. And my attorney said, he gave me the best advice. He said, whatever you do, just go hard. Just stay focused. Every time you get the mic, every time you get up and speak, he said, don't pay attention to what they're saying. Mm, mm, mm. Just keep continue to pour. Continue to pour. Stay focused on school. We got grad. I mean, he was just, and, and, and my attorney was a good friend of mine and a mentor. He said, listen, man, you'll be you graduating in another year, year and a half. He's like, you're going to be a therapist. You're going to change lives. He said, this will all be behind you. But he's like, I need you to stay focused on what's ahead of you and not what's behind you. And in therapy, uh, the therapist said, man, you know, I told him, I said, man, I don't know if I could date, man. And he told me, he says, Jay, you have PTSD. Yeah. He said, you because, bro, I'm talking about, like, people, the stuff that people were saying in my DMs, man, and I'm just like, I had people hitting me up like, man, I hear you out here putting your hands on women. I'm like, what? I said, are you serious? And you would just, bro, ignore, those. Just, you would just ignore those. Bro, I would just ignore it. People saying stuff like, oh, bro, I heard, you know what I'm saying? You gay, man. I heard you out here. I'm like. How can you prove you not gay? Like, 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 just think about trying to prove that. And how, but, but see, it's, trick, it's a trick bag. Cause yeah, see, the trick bag is the enemy is going to put you in a space or force you in a space to where, like, well, now I got to smash all these yeah, chicks. Every last one of them. Not. Exactly. Every last one of them. If, and I want I mean? them to publicly tell everybody. I want. Exactly. I just want to just do stuff all inappropriate. Exactly. I want a sex tape out there. I just want to just def exactly. just assassinate my whole character by myself. Exactly. And <laughs> self destruct. No, and God, God was so near, man. Uh, Letarius is doing that during that time because he said, "Son, I got you in this space." And and I remember one day, um, I just finished speaking, and I was in a hotel, and uh, they the driver that was driving me around and dropped me off, and they looked me in my eyes and they said, "Hey, man, you gonna you gonna have to go up in the spirit to combat this because, man, I'm talking about every week." What the driver something. knew. Yeah, every, right. because I just finished speaking at a uh, at a at a big church um, in Toronto, actually in Canada, and uh, the driver um, she said 
She said, Jay, you're going to have to go in the spirit, man. I went into my hotel room, bro, fell on my knees, and I cried so bad, man, out to God. And I just let my tears flow. I just let my tongues flow. I just, I said, God, man, I can't. Like, you're going to have to be with me through this. Because one of the things that mm-hmm. I can deal with, some that you say I did, I'm like, yeah, I did that. Yep, yep. You know, but when it's something I'm like, man, I know yeah. the character of this person. I know the pattern and the behavior yes. of this person. Yes. So it's like, dude, this is, but the one thing, man, that, that taught me to is to really give attention to the signs that we see and not try to pray them away. Yes. And we yes. do that a lot. Mm-mm-mm. We do that a lot. It, even as men, we'll see things and, you know, um, people call them red flags. You call them whatever you want. But there are times where things show themselves in the behavior. And see, I was trying not to be a therapist in this perspective because yeah. I saw it. I saw it. I saw it coming. I remember sitting on the floor and God said, I'm getting ready to shake this thing up. And I had no idea what he was talking about because I felt like a friend of mine who was my manager at the time was managing me. And she said, this is, this, this is God, God is going to end this thing because something is not right. She didn't have a good feeling about it. And when all of that stuff happened, she says, Jay, this is what I, this is what I didn't have a good feeling about. And so it's almost as if I'm going to go on this tour to, uh, uh, to, to, to tear you down and for people to see, you know. And when God said, don't say nothing, it was almost like the more I didn't say anything, it just, it just fueled, fueled it. But, man, boy, boy, boy. when I look at, bro, when I look at where I'm at now, and not having spoke about it on social media, I didn't sub for the people out there watching. I ain't I didn't post no subliminal messages. Yeah, I didn't do nothing. I kept walking in my call and kept walking in my purpose. That's what I kept doing, and God just kept elevating me. Was it hard? It was man, bro. It was hard because it was by two years. I went on for two years. By two years, yeah. God, uh, and nobody. And here's the thing, bro. Nobody never knew I was going through this silently. Unless you, you know, unless you were on her page and you followed her. But my, my boys knew and they would often say, bro, I, I've never seen a strength like that, dude. Because they would often say, Jay, you got to say something. My family, Jay, you got to say something. And I would say, man, God told me I can't say nothing, man. I got to. He said, don't say nothing. But saying all that to say is that men need safe spaces to say what they feel. Yes. Because if we don't say what we feel, it's going to be internalized, and that is depression turned outside. And it leads to suicide. Yes. It leads to self-destructive behavior. It leads to substance abuse, uh, sexual uh, promiscuity. Um, I mean, promiscuous. Um, it, it, it leads to so many different things, man, because... We want to be heard, and and what and that's what I'm realizing. Even with this men's group, man, brothers are talk. They will. When they you just give them gotta space. trust you. They gotta trust you, and they and they will they will open up, especially when they're talking to other brothers. Uh, they'd be like, man, let me tell you something, man. This chick did such 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 such. It was a guy that was uh, last week. The technician from um, my internet provider. He was coming in to boost up the speeds to my internet. And he was he was like like uh, popping his neck or whatever, and he's like, "Man, I'm tired." He's a Hispanic dude. He's I've been working seven days straight, and uh, I was like, "Dang!" I said, "But that check looked good, huh?" He's like, "Yeah, it looked real good." He said, "But I'm tired." He said, and uh, he said, "I got you know I'm paying child support and all that." And I said, "Oh," I said, "How many kids you got?" He said, "I got two kids," and I said, "They by the same woman?" He's like, "Yeah, my ex wife," and I said, "Oh, really?" And I said, "Yeah, I've been through a divorce too." He said, "Yeah, my." My wife uh, left me with uh, left me for my best friend, and then I was like, "Wow!" I said, "Oh, so are y'all are y'all still cool?" He's like, "Man, that mother effer won't even look me in the eye." He was like, "He was like, 
I was like, man, how'd that feel? He said, man, that hurt. He said, he said, that was real effed up. And I was like, wow, this is interesting that, that God allowed that conversation to happen with me because that's, that's, that's embarrassing. You know, that's a painful thing to say that your, your wife left you for your best friend. You know what yeah. I'm saying? And just for him to say that. And I was like, man, thank you for sharing that. You know what I'm saying? Because yeah. I take it as an honor, honor when God allows someone to share something with me, uh, on that level because you know, this man is working his butt off. Think about how that feels to be paying child support when your wife, because I was thinking about that when he left, I was like, man, this is messed up. Like your kid, your wife has custody of the kids and you over here slaving for child support and she left you to be with your friend. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, how did they not work that out in court where he got custody of the kids? Uh, but it's interesting that men go through this pain. Michael Basin wrote a book one day called Men Cry in the Dark. And mm -hmm. um, I think that that is exactly what happens. We will oh. cry in the dark. Yeah, are, you sh are you shell-shocked from that past relationship? Are you, uh, are you in the place now where you're, um, like your counselor said, that you have PTSD? Do you still believe you have PTSD? No, I, I think I'm past it. Am I a bit um, guarded? Absolutely. Of course. At, at this point, because for me, it was like, man, I'm building this and – you know, I got these books, I got these programs, I have my platform, and I feel like, you know, for me, dude, I almost lost all of this yeah. over a lie. So, are you and dating anybody right now? No. So, you're not dating anybody? Are you open to dating? I'm open to dating now. You know, I'm at a place, um, but I'm very selective because I feel like at this point, God has taken me to uh, a, a level that's going to really impact men and really impact the nation and, and, and bringing men together to heal. So I want to be careful who I bring into that space and who I Good. share that with, man. Good. Because, Good. again, that right Good. there showed me, like, man, the wrong woman. Can mess up everything. Tear down a whole kingdom. You see it in the Bible all the time. Will, t will destroy a whole kingdom. Um, so what does dating look like? Here on the Dear Future Wifey podcast, I really love to talk about what does dating after going through um, your healing, how do you transition to that? Is it something that you're interested in to be doing intentionally where you say, yeah, once I start opening my mind up to date, I'm dating, looking for a wife, or are you the type to say, ah, yeah, we'll go break bread, go out to eat, go to movies, do whatever as soon as COVID changes, but we'll go out to movies or whatnot. Um, and you know, it depends on what happens. What happens, then my mind may shift and start thinking about marriage. But what is it? What's your take? Is it intentional dating or just? I I believe like I I like to go out and break bread. Like I really like to fill out people's spirits. Now, yeah. like I I didn't do that in the past. It was kind of like, and even my 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 friends uh, that are girls, they said Jay, and that's the football thing, right? She was like, man. You go all in. You 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 like balls to the wall. You, like you know what I'm saying, hundred miles an hour, and that's what I would do. Rather than doing my research and collecting data, yeah, and that's what you do in dating. And rather than seeing, not only is there compatibility, but where's uh, is there a level of comfort that you feel? Is there a level of interest that you have together? And so for me, I like to break bread. I like to kind of talk and get to know you, and then. Once I feel comfortable, then I'm gonna make a decision on the intentionality that I'm going to pursue. And so it's just like I I remember telling one lady, I said, No, I'm I'm just really not in the, the good uh, Yeah. I said, I'm just really not in the space to date right now. I you know, you're a beautiful woman. Blah, blah. This lady replied back, she said, That's the problem with you, man. Y'all don't know a good woman when you see one. And I said, I said, no, I said, no, ma'am, this, this has nothing to do about whether you're good. I just, I'm just saying that the space Where I'm, I'm at, the space right I'm at now, because again, I'm going to be honest about that because when I'm in the space, you can, you can turn a good woman bad. Exactly. And I say that a lot. It's like, you don't, you don't want me while I'm in, in the, in, in intensive care right now. If God is doing surgery on me, there's some blood you're going to see. There's going to be some stuff you just don't want to see right now. Let me get patched up. Let me get healed so that when I walk into the next relationship, it's a, you're getting the whole me. Exactly. You know, you're getting the whole me and not the whole me. So, <laughs> so that's what you Exactly. That's real. It's real. So it's That's like, real. hey, there's a process before the promise, man. So, Jay, man, I appreciate you so much for taking time to uh, come on the Dear Future Wifey podcast. 
Hello King, where can that book be purchased? Hello King, Letters to a Young Queen, and Finding Our Lost Kings and Queens. All of my books can be purchased on Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, iTunes, and Kindle. What's your social media? Social media is at King J Barnett, all one word together. Man, King J Barnett. Uh, I appreciate you for taking time to be on the Dear Future Wifey podcast. Thank you for your vulnerability. And man, I've been truly blessed by you being a guest on the show. Appreciate you, brother. Listen, I got to say that this episode was extremely impactful to me. So make sure that you share this episode with a lot of your male friends. And I think that a lot of men need to hear that it's okay to have feelings and to share those feelings. But this is the part of the podcast episode where I manifest my future. Dear future wifey, it is imperative that we become each other's safe place. I mean that from the bottom of my heart. I'll be your place of refuge. Prepare your heart to become a pillow that allows me to rest peacefully in my truths. I will be that for you. The pain I went through a couple of years ago is what birthed this podcast. I'm pleased with my healing process thus far. The experiences shared by today's guest almost triggered me, but I prepared myself emotionally, took a deep breath, and anchored my soul in the growth of my healing. I am unapologetically a man on a mission for restoration and self-discovery. Love is a journey. The first step is acknowledging we're afraid to be hurt again. I have faith in you to protect my heart. I'm building the mental fortitude, spiritual aptitude, and relational longitude to become the husband you prayed for your future hubby thank you for listening to the dear future wifey podcast remember be lit live intentionally and transparently and don't stop loving make sure to subscribe to our dear future wifey youtube channel we're available on apple Podcasts, google Podcasts, spotify and stitcher we welcome your support simply share our podcast with your friends and family